Please join me in standing for our gospel lesson. Again, reading from Luke chapter 18, uh, verses 31 through 34, looking again at those six verb phrases and closing it up with the final one this evening. And taking the 12, he said to them, see, we are going to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what he said. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. So one of the biggest questions that all of us wrestle with from time to time, and uh, probably more when we're young, but I think this can plague us when we're old too, and honestly, it's a very important question. Is there a life on the other side of this one? I know many of you here here today would just say unequivocally, yes. Yes, there is. Uh, But I'm here to say with great conviction that that's the correct answer. Because I, too, would say with great passion and conviction, yes, there is a life on the other side of this one. And so tonight, as we wrap up our Lent series, looking at the the final verb phrase in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, we look at the third day he will rise again. Now, in that text, the word will is very important. If you see the, the certainty, the certainty of a God who keeps his promises, the certainty of a God who is determined to bring salvation and the promise of the resurrection through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As I have said before, these six verb phrases kind of summarize the entirety of Christ's mission through his incarnation as he was born in a manger in Bethlehem all the way through to his ascension to the right hand of the Father. This salvation would come through the promised Messiah, again promised all throughout the Old Testament, All those promises are there for us to remind us continually that we serve a God who keeps his promises, but also that we serve a God who so loved the world that he refused to leave us without hope. And so today, as we kind of take a brief look at that statement on the third day, he will rise. What we're going to do is take kind of a brief journey uh, through the Old Testament scriptures into the New Testament and look at the concept of the afterlife and how that began to develop in the scriptures and the resurrection of not only of of you and I and those who trust in God, but the resurrection of Jesus and how that points forward to the great second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Join me as we pray. Lord, I thank you for this text and this wonderful journey that we're going to take tonight as we travel through the Old Testament into the Gospels and then also into the Epistles and see how you developed that concept and progressively revealed the promise of the resurrection for those who believe. Lord, I pray that every single word that proceeds from my mouth would be from you and not from me. May it be in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word, and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. And so as sin entered into the world, as we see in Genesis chapter 3, as Adam and Eve fell prey to uh, the deception of Satan, two types of death entered into the world. Uh, The first type of death was spiritual death. That now each one of us is born with that original sin nature that causes us to be born sinful and separated from God. But the other type of death is the ability to die physically. Uh, This morning I went to um, a funeral of a a friend, uh, a former congregation member, and it's so joyful to go to a funeral for someone who you know trusted in Christ who was passionate about their faith in Jesus. And I appreciated what the pastor said. Uh, Pastor Jorgensen uh, said that as he visited Vernon uh, in the hospital on one of the last days of his life, he read a, a text to him and Vernon just looked at him and just said, I love Jesus. What a beautiful testimony. What a wonderful thing to hear from the mouth of someone who's about to pass from this life to the next. But how is that picture kind of unfolded within Scripture? When do we begin to see the the first aspects of an afterlife or the first picture of the resurrection power of God through the promised Messiah? Well, it begins as early as Genesis chapter 5. And I know a lot of times we pass over the genealogies, 
Uh, but this is a genealogy you probably shouldn't pass over. And it's the genealogy of Adam and, and on all of his children kind of following. But they get to a man named Enoch in chapter 5, verse 24. And it has such an in interesting, very cryptic saying. And it says this, Enoch walked with God and he was, and he was not. <laughs> Meaning he was here and then he wasn't. And God just took him because he is described as a righteous man. Now, the writer of Hebrews kind of expounds upon this in chapter 11, verse 5, on this Enoch who walked with God, and God just kind of took him. He'd never experienced physical death. It says in this, again, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And so as early as this, well, where did God take him? You know, we start to kind of develop these questions. If you go a little bit further, a man named Abraham, as he too was on his deathbed, as he breathed his last, it says in Genesis chapter 25, verse 8, and he died in a good old age. He was, a, what, 175 years old? <laughs> as he died a good old age, an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. Interesting statement. Again, sparking kind of this idea that there is a life on the other side of this one. In, in Jacob's death, it's really the same language. At last, he was gathered to his people after he breathed his last. As we kind of fast forward to the book of 1 Samuel, and this dear woman named Hannah, uh, who was childless, and she was pleading with God for a son, and God answered her prayer and gave her a son named Samuel, who ended up being the great prophet for the nation of Israel that not only elected their first king or anointed their first king, Saul, who we'll talk about in a minute, but also anointed King David as king over Israel. But as Hannah's prayer was answered, she has this beautiful song in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, and it's the first time we actually see the word Messiah used as well, and that's in verse 10. But in verse 6, she says this, The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. And so here you start to see, and it's kind of like a slow focus. I don't know if you like to use cameras. Recently, I bought a newer camera, and I love taking pictures of landscapes and insides of churches and stuff. And sometimes you just kind of have to slowly use that focus um, dial on the lens so that you can really see the sharpness of where that focus. Because if you move it too fast, you sometimes miss that prime spot of focus. And that's exactly kind of what's going on here. It's kind of a slow focus to the picture that God is painting, again, through the promise of the Messiah. Now, King Saul, as I mentioned before, he was an interesting guy. He was the first king of Israel. Uh, I, I would love to tell you he was a good king, but he really wasn't at all. Uh, he was an insecure man. He was really tall. He was a very big man, but yet he had a, a great deal of fear. And he had a, a real lack of trust in the promises of God. So much so that Samuel, who was the great prophet of Israel, after he died, he did something that is expressly forbidden in the law of Moses in those first five books of the Bible. We're never to seek what's called necromancers or seers or mediums. Some people call them witches. And so what does Saul do? Because he's confused. He doesn't know what to do. Uh, he doesn't really spend any time in prayer, doesn't spend any time in fasting like he's supposed to do, uh, doesn't go to the priest, the high priest, and speak with him. He doesn't go with maybe another prophet of the land. What he does is he actually goes to a medium in the city of Endor. And as she begins uh, to do this, she knows the laws of Israel and that anyone who practices this type of, uh, of sorcery or whatever you want to call it, witchcraft or doing seances. Anyone that does this in Israel would be stoned to death. They would be killed. So she was afraid. So Saul goes to her and he's kind of hidden. He's got a disguise on and he talks her into doing this. And so we're going to pick it up in chapter 28 of 1 Samuel, uh, looking at verse 11. It says, then the woman, this medium, said, whom shall I bring up for you? And she's talking to Saul. Saul says, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see 
a God coming out of the earth, small g, by the way. He said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, it's an old man who is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel and he bowed his face to the ground and paid homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, think about this. This guy's dead. And so there is an afterlife. And if you read through that story, if you read through the rest of it, Samuel begins to really chew out Saul and says, what you've done is evil. Why have you called me up? In a sense, why didn't you seek the Lord? Why are you trying to find out God's will through a way that is expressly forbidden according to God's word? And that's really kind of the moment when Saul's kingship was taken away from him and given over to David. And David was anointed king over Israel. The book of Psalms continues to bring things into a clearer focus. In Psalm 49, verse 15, it says, but God will ransom my soul from the power of the grave and he will receive me. There's this picture again of being received in a place where God is for those who trust in him. Psalm 73, verse 24 says, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me in glory. Again, this picture of God receiving us into a glorified state or a a state that's beyond this world. Psalm 86, verse 13, for great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. And it continues in various other Psalms talking about this existence that's on the other side of this life. This life that, that we can't really speak about. It transcends what we know in the here and now. The person who really began to bring it into focus was the prophet Isaiah. As I said before, there are so many Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah in Isaiah, but there's a lot of information about the resurrection, not only of us, but also of the faithful suffering servant as well. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8 says this, he will swallow up death forever. Can anybody say amen? He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. There's this place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, a place where you're not going to be crying tears of pain and sadness No more tears of the loss of a loved one, the pain and the suffering, the horrible tragedy that we heard about in Tennessee. I can't imagine being a parent of a child that's gone through that. The pain and suffering of people in Mississippi that have lost everything they own. All of that will be gone. And to that I say hallelujah. Daniel continues to bring it into focus and says, and many of those who sleep, and that's a picture of death. And that's what I love about scripture. It describes death as this temporary place, a sleep where we will awaken to our true home. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so here even Daniel is talking about heaven and hell at the same time. But perhaps one of the clearest expressions is found in one of the oldest books of the, of the Old Testament, the book of Job. Job was a man that suffered more than probably most of us here and maybe more than any of us here. Uh, he suffered great loss. He lost all of his children, lost a great deal of his herd, and, and he lost, uh, I guess, the, the faith of his wife. He had seven friends that when they came to see them, they were much better friends when they kept their mouth shut. And then when they began to have that conversation, they began to honestly confuse principles with promises. But as someone talked about the afterlife and said, is there one? Will there be such a thing? Is it going to be going down to the grave and then that'll be it? This is Job's response. One of the oldest books in the Old Testament. Job 19, verses 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And I at last shall stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, after he's dead, yet in my flesh I shall see God. He's talking about the resurrection. Yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold him and not another. 
What a beautiful picture. And he goes on to say, he says before this, oh, that my words were written on a tablet, they would be carved in stone. Well, in a sense, they are. They're preserved for us in God's holy word. And Job's prayer was answered. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that we have this text that says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Listen to the certainty of that. There is a life on the other side of this one. The question is, is where will your final destination be? As we turn our hearts into the New Testament, Jesus continues to reveal through the Gospels and also through the epistles, through the apostles, they're in their writings, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus clearly talked about the resurrection of the dead as he was predicting his own uh, resurrection. Perhaps Matthew chapter 24 and 25 are among the clearest indications and honestly a good reminder that this world is not our home and that Jesus will come a second time to judge the living and the dead as we confess on a weekly basis. Like Daniel, Jesus makes it very clear that both heaven and hell exists and they are eternal, as he says in Matthew 25, verse 46. In John chapter 11, as we heard last Sunday, Martha and Jesus was having a conversation because Martha's brother, Lazarus, had died. She says to Jesus, if you had been here, I know that my brother would not have died, but I know that whatever you ask, the Father will give it to you. Jesus said, he will rise again. Martha says, and again, hear her knowledge of the resurrection on the last day. Martha said to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But then Jesus says those remarkable words. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And there's that beautiful picture of a life that's on the other side of this one. Jesus continually and clearly reminded all of us, including Martha, that this world is not our home. Jesus, in a conversation with Nicodemus in chapter 3, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that means killed on the cross. And that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And here's that picture. Because a very interesting thing happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so the high priestly aspect of Israel was appointed to the the tribe of the Levites, and that's where we get Leviticus from. The family of the Levites were all supposed to be the high priests and the priests for Israel. But unfortunately, in the intertestamental period, if you read through some of the interesting um, history that's preserved in the book of Maccabees, there's four books of Maccabees. It's really fascinating. It's really like a soap opera. Leaders killing leaders. And two political parties emerged. Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they took over the priestly duties. Now, some of them were from the tribe of Levi, as we see in Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, the father and mother of John the Baptist. But many of them were not from the tribe of Levi. It became about political power, control, and corruption. That's why Jesus overturned the money changers in the temple, because they were basically doing usury, charging exorbitant amounts for products, kind of like you go when you go to a movie theater, you know, just, just jacking up the prices so high just for the, to line their own pockets. And that's why Jesus was so angry that two times he overturned the money changers, as we see recorded in the Gospel of John. Three times Jesus predicted his own resurrection. Mark chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, as well as in Matthew and Luke and John. He also, as he spoke to the Pharisees and Sadducees in more of a cryptic way, he looks at them and said, destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and in three days I will rise it up again. And he kept giving illustration and illusion that he would too rise from the dead. I love Paul because he kind of brings both of them together. In Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it says, we are buried therefore with Jesus by baptism into death, in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Hallelujah. I know it's still Lent, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's my birthday. I can do that, right? (laughs) Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. This picture of because of Christ's resurrection, we too have that promise of resurrection. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The perishable, the temporary body must put on the imperishable. The mortal must put on immortality. And there's this beautiful picture that at one point, and and I, I am I know that all of us have struggled with our bodies, whether it hurts or we just don't want to get up in the morning or we end up breaking a leg or spraining an ankle or having some joint replaced or anything like that. We've all struggled and groaned in our body. There will be a new immortal body where we will run and not grow weary. We will walk and we will not faint, where we will have no pain, no fear, no more sorrow, and no more loneliness. Can anybody say amen? Amen. And then at Christ's second coming, on the wonderful day we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, those who are alive at the time will be caught up in the air with the Lord, and that's when we receive those bodies of immortality. And then Jesus will do another remarkable thing. After he judges the living and the dead, he will recreate the heavens and the earth, and we will live for all eternity in the presence of God on a recreated heaven and earth with no more danger, no more pain, no more natural catastrophes, no more school shootings, no more wars or rumors of wars. Isn't this really the greatest hope that we have? Isn't it the only really true source of peace that is found in this world? The resurrection reminds us that we are kind of, we're just passing through. We're journeying toward our true home, the promised land of God's eternal kingdom, consummated at Christ's second coming. We are aliens and we are sojourners on our way to our true home. This world is not all there is. And so the question is, our souls will live in one of two places for all eternity. We have a finite beginning as we are born. And 56 years ago, I was born on this day. And that's when I began. Created in the image of God. Born a sinner under the bondage of Satan until my baptism. Then I was brought out of darkness into God's marvelous light. In times I ran from that light, especially during those ages of 18 and 24. And I was a fool. I was a fool. But thank God we serve a God who pursues us and leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And he has done that for each one of us here today. Amen. And so there is a life on the other side of this one. The question is, where will you spend eternity? I will leave you with the words of Jesus and the most important question that anyone could ever ask you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Lord, I pray that as we close with the powerful words and that question from Jesus, that we would respond as Martha did. Lord, I believe. We thank you that scripture reminds us that you keep your promises, that you are with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us. We thank you that we have an eternal home that is beyond our wildest imagination. For no eye has seen, no ear heard, or mind of man imagined what you have in store, who trust you and endure to the end. May that give us peace and comfort in the here and now. And as we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, though we suffer, we have this idea of suffering, we are being refined through those sufferings. We are being purified, strengthened, and brought to a spiritual maturity through those sufferings that we endure. And may we always cling to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of our faith, 
who willingly went to the cross for each one here. A savior whom the grave could not hold. A savior who on the third day rose again because we serve a risen and living savior who is Christ our Lord. May we never lose sight of that reality. I pray these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said.